Welcome to this week's edition of the Turning Points Podcast, where we get to speak to a wonderful, bright light of an individual, uh, Susan Robertson, who, you know, kind of surprises both. Uh, We don't generally go into, you know, too much expectations when we get into these podcasts, but uh, she was somebody that neither one of us had ever met, and uh, what a pleasant surprise. I... I was captivated, and uh, I would have gone another hour and a half if we had the opportunity. Well, we did go another half hour at least after that we hung up and talked about more, you know, we should have recorded that conversation too. So (laughs) Susan Robertson is the co-founder and CEO of um, Lindsay's Conscious Business Group. Um, For over 31 years, she has worked with businesses worldwide focusing on executive leadership and cultural transformation. And she has two books. One is called Real Re- Real uh, Leadership, which is um, helps to awaken the wisdom uh, of leaders. And the other one is called Real Culture, the Catalyst for Conscious Business. So, I mean, that's like her business bio. But man, her story, you know, growing up with, um, you know, sexual trauma, uh, abuse and uh, poverty and becoming going into banking and becoming incredibly successful financially, walking both worlds, yeah. which, which I loved. Yeah, she was vulnerable. She was very open. uh, And I I think the empowerment that came from that is, you know, under I I, I couldn't state it anymore. So listen and check her out. She's she's awesome. Enjoy. Hello, Susan. Welcome to our podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. All right. So our first question that we start off every podcast with is, you know, many seekers can recall that point in time when they started to question their reality or their conditioned beliefs, their childhood beliefs. So do you remember when you became a seeker? The exact day. Um, I was actually seven years old. I wouldn't have known that I was a seeker at that time. Sure. But um, I witnessed, saw a a spirit, in my language at that time, I would have said an angel. And it was, it actually was quite scary to me. And shortly after that, what I realized it was an omen of what was to be. Um, Shortly after that, I started hearing voices and seeing things. And I grew up Catholic 12 years, actually 13 years if you include kindergarten, of Catholic schooling. And so those kinds of things weren't um, normal. And, you know, so I would try and seek out what that was. I can actually remember further back having what my mother would call growing pains, which I've now learned those that were around the age of five. I've now learned those were like the Kundalini opening up and coming up and I would like fall over and faint and things like that. And I could actually remember those experiences because my mother gave me a spanking when I would do that. If she hadn't given me a spanking, I might not have remembered. But those kinds of things started quite young for me. And then um, there was trauma in my life, physical, sexual abuse, um, you know, living with without financial support. And so I remember in Catholic high school, a couple of teachers sort of came to my aid. And that's when I first really got into meditation, um, uh, meditation to drumming. Sister Marie helped me with that. Um, Understanding the psychological implications of the things that happened to me. But I knew that um, I needed to understand. And then in my journey, I I tell people I got psychologized, I got Buddhaized, I got Hinduized, I got Catholicized. And um, I could tell that they, some, most of these people didn't know what they were really talking about. They knew what they read. And so then I was looking and then about the age of 26 was when I met my teachers, um, Soligiu and Marquise And they were the only ones that I felt for me were like, we understand it. Well, Soligiu was like, well, this is what you see, this is what you hear, this is what happens to you and all that. And I'm like, okay, that's really good. I think <laughs> I'll stay. <laughs> and so 26 years later, um, I'm still learning, as I would say. So I would say my turning point for the spiritual route was when I was quite young. And then um, realizing that I wasn't a nut job was probably much later in life, in life you know. 
So were you, do you have a lot of memories and were you present through some of the, you know, I don't, the traumatic aspects of your childhood? Were you, as you were being punished, was there a sense of, you know, confusion through all that as to like, you don't really understand why you're being punished for something that seems uncontrollable? Yeah. I mean, like the, um, when I was much younger before sexual abuse came, um, getting in trouble for, you know, I didn't faint on purpose. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I didn't want to see scary things that people said didn't exist and be told I was lying and have my mouth washed out with soap and things like that. Um, and, and yeah, I have very distinct memories of those times. And those were the times before the sexual abuse happened. And so I think that that kind of um, emotional, psychological and sexual abuse, like only intensified because I could, um, in order to keep myself safe, I, I realized I understood things about my stepfather. And so I would sit in what I now understand is meditation going, okay, what's going to happen? Mm. And I would, what I would now say is ask the universe. Um, I didn't know who I was asking before because, you know, I was quite mad at God for a long time and Jesus and, you know, like, why the hell did you stick me in this family? You know? Um, so I was asking someone yeah. and I would get, I would get answers that would allow me to stay as I've learned much later in life, safer than what happened to my sisters, you know, particularly on the sexual abuse side. And then along the way, then I met a lot of really nice angels, if you will, in the form of human beings who helped support and guided. And it was uh, in particular one teacher when I was about um, 15 years old, uh, he was uh, doing a PhD. And so I would go to his house and we often didn't have food. So he and his wife, Ed Budash and Joan Budash would feed me. And then he'd take me down in the basement and I'd meditate and I'd try to do astral projection because I didn't like the, the space I was in. So I thought, well, I'll just get out of the apartment. <laughs> yeah. It's so painful there. You know, <laughs> I used to wait for, like I wanted to see the silver string or the golden thread and, you know, it never happened. So <laughs> way so, later in life, it's like, dang Where it. do you think you got that language, the silver string and, and that, but were, were you reading books at that time then? Um, Catholic school, which I didn't realize that this didn't happen for everyone. Sister Marie, my English teacher and my world religion teacher, um, didn't realize till the following year, till many years later that she was no longer a nun after this year uh, she left, but we studied world religions. And so in that we were, I did a whole quarter on just extrasensory perception. And then she was the one that would take us into the church and play drumming music. We lay on the pews and play drumming music and we would have to breathe to it. Mm. And then my, my teacher uh, at Budash would then take me into meditations around because I was looking at telekinesis, teleaudience, clairvoyance, all that stuff. Um, so he was trying to help me with that, but he was also because he understood my background. He was my sixth grade teacher at one time. He was also working with me psychologically to help with psychological healing. And so the meditations, he actually was the first one to teach me holotropic breath work. So I was 14 and a half or 15 when I did my first holotropic breath work. Not again, not realizing that's what I was doing. Right. You know, so it was a period of time, and then it was just okay. Now I got to find people to help me with this. Well, and you know, nonetheless, knowing what it actually is, the, the healing that can come from that, regardless, is you know very powerful. And I mean, what a gift to be able to have that. You know, here's a circumstance. You know, you might not be able to change completely, but yeah. here are tools to decide how to process that situation differently. And, you know, I'm sure at the time you didn't, it was an escape and you were hiding from your circumstances, but yes. all along you're getting these tools and these, you know, access to these, this mindfulness practice that ultimately probably saved a, a good majority of your experience for you. Yeah, it was, it was a major turning point of my life. I mean, I actually found my sixth grade teacher. Thank God he was an Ed Smith or something like that. <laughs> I don't know that I would have found him, but he had an unusual last name. And I really credit the, yes, yeah, Sister Marie was really important, but I really credit Ed Budash for my journey into the psychological breathing um, meditative states in that way, because it was so 
mm, emotionally and psychologically healing for me. Um, that that you know ultimately when I look back now, I mean it's I teach those things, and I you know really I wrote him a letter and saying I really credit you for helping me learn this at such a young age. Talk about angels in human form. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. That is so wonderful. So was that in, were you saying, was that in Catholic school or how long were you in Catholic yeah, school? Yeah, Ed, Ed was my sixth grade teacher in Catholic school. And then what are you like 12 then? Um, and then uh, Sister Marie, I was like 14. Um, and, you know, just had these opportunities in the, in the form of world religion that really shaped, I think, the course of my entire life. Um, as I, as I look back now, you know, so that's, that's where I got, you know, so Sister Marie, I'm reading about the golden thread and like, oh, well, that sounds really cool to do with. <laughs> yeah, I want to, I want to melt that spoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm 14, 15 years old. That's all like really cool, right? Yeah. And, um, but it was, it was such a shaping point in my life, you know, now I'm almost 60, so um, it's been a large part of my life. Yeah. It's like, the, it's like the groundwork was, was being laid. And I, and I feel like, cause you know, we've been doing this podcast now since October. So what's that six months or something like that, seven months, something like that. Bit. And, um, and, and we were curious before we started, like what would be sort of the similarities. And that does tend to be like people typically do have childhood experiences. Seekers do have childhood experiences. They're young and a lot of, you know, it seems like we're more open because sometimes I think, I mean, I had a lot of also ex really wacky, wonderful spiritual experiences along the way when I would, for the first 20, 30 years of my life. And the last 30, you know, the last 30 has been, I'm almost 60 as well. It has been more of this like integration, this deepening, this wisdom, you know, that's happening. And sometimes like I'm writing my memoirs the last couple of years and I'm like, well, gosh, I had so many, like, such cool things. How come, like, that doesn't happen anymore? And then I, I you know, it's just the, what the mind does. And then I think, no, it's it's a much more of a deepening. It's not about states that come and go. And, and these and these experiences are, are we're just seem to be, for whatever reason, open to them. When we're young, the ego, I think, isn't fully, uh, fully formed yet. Um, we're just more in touch with the world that we left, you know, recently. And um, yeah, so so what I would like to hear if you if you wouldn't mind sharing more detail about that experience when you were seven. Well, um, my mother had divorced and she had met somebody and um, at that time, you know, she was going to get married and it meant we were leaving San Diego and moving to Cleveland. And I don't know, I had to run in the house and get something. And as I was coming back, I noticed something moving in the bedroom. And so I popped my head into the bedroom and I saw this, what looked like a shadow, had big wings kind of thing moving across the wall. And then I looked behind me to see, was that me? Like, was there somehow a strange reflection? And then I thought it was my, my neighbor across the street, Brian, who always liked to play tricks. And then I could hear him outside. And so then I just, you know, because you can have a thousand things go through your mind in a half a second. And so I stood there watching it, but the, the hard part was, is it was carrying a knife. So that's what made it scary mm. to me. Well, you know, the person my mother married was a pedophile. Um, and, you know, and I found that out later that I remember telling my mother about it. And of course, that was just your imagination. It was probably just your shadow, you know, what were you carrying in your hand? I'm like, but I was standing still and it was moving. And so that was my, other than the fainting stuff when I was younger, that was my real distinct memory of seeing something that people would say is not there. Yeah. You know, so, um, and that either fortunately or unfortunately for me, I retained, you know, so later on that moved into seeing auras and um, what I would call hitchhikers around people and um, things like that. <laughs> That's a good way to put that, that you know. bean. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Sean, um, your microphone, I don't think is on. I think you're, you're on your uh, computer, Mike. You want to check that? 
I just well. noticed a little while ago and, and, and yeah, and we can always cut stuff out, Susan. So it's, that's why I, it's not live at all. So I just, he's usually has this bo bo booming voice. And when he started talking a little while ago, I'm like, no, nothing now. Is that better or no? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry about that. So guy. much better. It, it, I hear my, I hear the microphone in my, through my interface. So I didn't, I didn't know any difference. I apologize. No, it's okay, hon. We, we sort of got on just a few minutes before. So we usually, we check things like that. So, okay, we're good. Cool. Well, that Susan, oh my gosh, that's, thank you for sharing that first of all. So I'm curious how you interpreted that. Cause I sort of have what my interpretation is from what you described and the little bit you described about the next, you know, 10 years of your life and, and the trauma. Um, so do you have an interpretation of the wings and the knife? Well, I mean, I think of it as that it was an omen that I didn't know how to interpret that mm -hmm. bad things were coming. And, you know, then from the time I was eight until 13, it was traumatic in terms of sexual abuse. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then after that, after he left our home, that's when the poverty occurred. Yeah. And, and all of that. And, you know, working, I was 14 years old and had like three jobs just to try and keep yeah. the lights on and you know many many times sitting in you know middle of winter no water no electric no no yeah. gas wow. and you know and then you know being very spiritual i guess because of the catholicism we went to school catholic school every day you know and then we became the poor family that the catholic church took care of so got very lucky in terms of education but everybody knew you know so i was wearing other people's um hand me down because we couldn't afford the the uniforms and you had to wear the uniforms or the hand me down of someone else's shoes or we got the boxes at different times to support food and uh, you know again that was you know, i think of turning points also is times in your life where things happen and you create belief structures that generally sound like i will always or i will never right, right? Yeah. and so i made up a lot of i will always and i will nevers out of these experiences and um and and some of them good and some of them you know kept me rigid that i needed to um and kept me in fear you know that i needed to break down and the reason why i felt like tony and rock Kay were such great um still are great uh guides for me in terms of my my whole evolution as a human being so, I love that. I will always, I will never. I, I hope you've written some stuff or, and, and have courses around that. I mean, I I'm, do. Yeah. I do. <laughs> Good. <Yeah. laughs> Good. Cause I want to send people their way that that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you're into autobiographies at all, but I just, and of course, because I'm a musician too, which we found out you are as well. Cause I think once you are, you always are. Yeah. Um, I just listened to Jewel, Jewel's autobiography, the singer Jewel. Oh. Mm -hmm. it's so good she was raised in destitute poverty up in Alaska and and she actually lived out of her car when she got a record deal she was living out of her car for over a year in San Diego wow. mm -hmm. and um, I just loved her story because she basically raised herself which I'm sure there was a lot of that going on with you how many sisters do you have um the ones I grew up with four yeah, yeah. Wow. extended family I have nine brothers and sisters but the wow. ones I grew up with very close to, you know, four, and, there were five of us all together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm sure, uh, I mean, I'm hoping that a trauma like that would, um, would bond you all somehow. Are you all close and. Well, no. Well, yes and no. But when uh -huh. we all hit 18, well, I was 17 when I left the house, we all just went our separate ways. It was right. like being together was going to uh, remind everyone of the pain and so for a long time we all just went our separate ways it broke the family wow you know so um my older sister and i we were together um we took custody of, our, of my younger sisters to get them out of that but then we found them living situations um that were going to be more conducive so that cindy and i could you know do things like go to college hold a job things like that so yeah, the whole family, when Cindy was 19, I was 18, we actually had legal custody of our younger children, of our younger children, of our sisters yeah. and two of our sisters. And, um, you know, that ended up um, creating because we placed what my one sister 
she went with her biological father. My other sister, her biological father was a pedophile, so she couldn't go that way. You know, so we actually made a very difficult choice because she was highly volatile. She was very angry. Cindy and I didn't really, I mean, we were children ourselves. You know, she had the, what I would say is the ultimate rejection is in that she, um, we placed her in a foster home. Wow. Which we actually thought was better for her. And in the long run, it really was. But, you know, it was, it was a gut wrenching decision that we, that Cindy and I took to get her away from my mother, to, to have her at least have a chance um, at some normalcy in life. But, mm -hmm. you know, she, you know, took it as, you know, ultimate rejection. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so. that's, that's, an, that's an impossible situation. I mean, you know, you're 19 and 18. Yes, you have, I'm sure have had responsibilities with helping your, your younger siblings, but not nearly qualified to to know how or what or could possibly be the right answer for that. Just knowing that the, the safest answer is the right answer in that context and that's tough, man. I mean, because uh, I, I grew up with some foster cousins that we had a lot of uh, foster kids in and out of um, my, my aunt and uncles who lived real close to us. And so it, it was it's always this kind of catch 22 situation where, yes, it's better, but there are residual effects from that that experience that that will manifest in some way that are unknowable at the time. And that's that's really hard. So I'm I'm hoping that there has been healing between you and your sister since then. And well, so she she actually became very alcoholic and still is. Oh man. And you know we and we tried as adults to um, help her get help, but that's it's just not it's it's just not happening. And yeah. even with her children, they have tried and it's not happening. So we've had to reconcile ourselves. I mean, my older sister and I've had to do a lot of, you know, it's the need for Sola Giyu and Rafu Skeg. You know, there was a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of um, fear, um, you know, maybe I should have, a lot of questioning, um, done it another way. Um, but then I also, you know, because I, what, I did hear voices and I was concerned I was not um, when I was in high school, I, I mean, I was, functioning crazy is what I thought. <laughs> I learned later that they, you would actually, as I studied the DSM-4, that they would call it schizotypal. Um, but I, I realized that, you know, if I listened to the guidance that would come, which was not my own voice, it was actually the voice of a, it's a male voice, that I, in the deepest of, you know, my heart of hearts, I knew it was the right decision. Yes. And so I went, we went with it, Cindy and I went, my yeah. older sister and I went with it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can, I can really start to see, we, we before we started recording, I, I had shared with you that I was kind of researching, looking on your different sites. And the first impression that I got was here is this deeply spiritual person who's had, you know, this wonderful journey, but also who is a very, um, you know, a, a, a leader in business as well and teaching leadership. And now I can see where this comes from and how, so I want to hear, you know, whatever you want to share next, but kind of what the next turning point of, because I can see you, you know, having to take so much responsibility and grow up sort of so fast that you were taking control of your life. And, um, and so I'm going to share how that next manifested. Well, there got, again, I feel like I was died and got lucky or whatever you want to call it, but I went into banking because they paid for college, mm -hmm. your better grades, hundred percent books and everything. And that was the only way I was going to go through college was that way or end up with a lot of debt. And I didn't want to do that. So I was on the 10 year plan that actually took more like 15 years to get through college. Um, and you know, the, the I will never be poor again was a, a very strong guiding principle. So banking was very foundational. Um, but I, I began to realize that I was starting to become what I called part of the walking dead. Hmm. Is that I would look around corporate halls and I would see people who just looked to me like they were walking dead people. And I 
thought to myself, I don't want to live that life. I don't care how safe it is. I don't want to live that life. And um, I ultimately met my husband. We've been together almost 33 years. He was my boss. He hired me. And I knew the moment I met him, he was the one. It was just like, I recognized him or something. And kind of tough when you're reporting to your boss that he doesn't know he's the one. Um, <laughs> How long did he take to get the memo? <laughs> uh, not very long, but then, you know, we had to negotiate that relationship because the, the, the bank would not have taken too kindly to, um, you know, that kind of situation, right? A reporting relationship. And so um, we became really good friends and found that we had a lot of the similar books in terms of, let's say, psychological stuff. I'm okay, you're okay, feel the fear, do it anyway, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And we were, again, very lucky that our bank sent us to a program that this company is no longer in existence called um, FAR Associates. And the same person that developed FAR Associates also uh, created an organization which is really, really big now called the Center for Creative Leadership. And so he was sort of like one of the founding people of the Center for Creative Leadership. And that is one of my main competitors today um, in, the, in the business world, that they focus primarily on uh, deep, insightful leadership and changing leadership to change lives and to change culture. And they were actually practicing, they, would, they don't have this anywhere on their website, but they, in my opinion, they were actually practicing conscious business practices and conscious leadership practices long before those terms were ever around because Dr. Fard started that back in 1968. So we had the opportunity to go through um, leadership and emotional intelligence programs, again, long before Daniel Goldman and how, how much you need emotional intelligence and deep awareness because as a leader, you can impact the lives of a hundred people a thousand people, forty thousand people, two hundred thousand people, and um, you know when I went through that program because I couldn't be a social worker because they were too poor, and I was never going to be poor again. Um, that's why I went into business. When I went through that, I said, "Okay, this is what I want to do when I grow up." So at age twenty-seven, even though I was scared to death, jumped into what would, could be potentially. Uh, lead me to the poorhouse again, which was start my own business with my husband. And it was really scary. But yet, it was one of those things you look back, I remember at that time, I'm like, we could always get back in, but I don't want to be in my 60s. And I'm getting close there now, looking back saying, I wish I would have. Yeah. How long... So from 27, how long after that point of starting the business did it take, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> before you felt comfortable, secure, how, before the business was fruitful enough? Well, I, I have a great story behind that because I was going to college while I was in high school and I had this horrible teacher. I wish I remember his name because I hated him, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I still have an aversion to block paper. Um, <laughs> he, he actually taught what is known as the rule of 72. This is how fast money compounds at a particular, how many, how many, how often it doubles. And so that was my first lesson into investment. So I think I was like 16 and a half, 17 years old, and we had to do it all by hand. So we had to, um, do math $5 a week compounded at 5% every week. Uh, 52 weeks a year for 25 years, you know, and back then, you know, I couldn't afford what they would call the HP that would have given me the answer. So you had to turn these in every week. But I remember thinking to myself at that age, I'm like, I could, based on the law of compounding average, um, how fast money doubles at a particular interest rate, that I could work at McDonald's and be a multimillionaire by the time I was 42. And that was a big financial insight for me. So when I got into banking, I put away 15% into a 401k and the bank matched me dollar for dollar. And then it was the eighties and you know I was like tripling my money in the eighties, um, making minimum wage, but tripling my money. And 
So it took a while, you know, at 42, I, I realized my number, but it took me till 44 to realize that I realized my number to finally be able to go, okay. Yeah, because it's different for everybody. So that's a great, that's a great, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's that's a, a very specific, great story. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I purposely scare my employees <laughs> <laughs> because I make them do the math yeah. and make them do the math. I'm like, you know, if you're already used to not living on X amount of money, living on less is not that big of a deal. And when you get a bonus, you just automatically yeah. put this away because it provides that financial security that, um, I mean, that's to me, that to me is what keeps people, that's what creates walking dead people. Mm. And, and, they, and, and then over living their, their, their means. Yeah. And so, so then they make, you know, when you live in fear like that, then you don't make the best decisions as a leader. Right. You're, you're just making decisions to, you know, satiate the need for anything to numb or to not, you know, realize what's really happening there, you know, to, to close your mind off from the real circumstances. My, my brother's a financial advisor and, um, you know, he, he says he's got people that make, you know, quarter million dollars of a year and they have almost nothing, you know, saved or nothing, you know, to retire on. And the biggest thing he's like, I'm just, he's like, I'm a therapist and I help people manage their lifestyle. If you can manage your lifestyle and, you know, live well within your means, it, it becomes pretty easy at that point. Like you're saying, you can work minimum wage and, you know, save X amount of money by the time you're 42. Th that's astonishing. And most people wouldn't believe you, you know, because right. like, why don't, why don't I don't have that right now? It's like, well, no, you got to become disciplined which, you know, that's a huge word for, for a lot of people is become yeah. disciplined with, with your lifestyle and your spending. And um, yeah, so, I mean. So man. Remember, I was never going to be poor again. Yes. Yeah, see, <laughs> so, that's the key. You were driven. You know, yeah. yeah. And so it was, that was what kept me going and making sure I never touched it. Plus I put it in, you know, in at that time, 401ks were pretty new. You couldn't touch it without a 10% penalty. Oh yeah. Or retirement. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. Once it's over there, it's gone. Yeah. It, it doesn't exist to me anymore um, as a source of funding of anything. And so I just learned to do that because I was, I was really intent on retiring at 42 because at 42, knowing the, the rule of 72, right, um, I know that my money would double at least two more times by the time I'm 65, if not three more times. So, I mean, that's what that man taught me using block paper and pencils <laughs> and math. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the thing is we, we teach math, but we don't, you know, oftentimes have practical application of math, um, you know, and that's, that's a huge thing. So, man, what a, what a trip. I mean, what a, it's funny because like, and I'd, I'd be curious to see your perspective on, you know how to manage the uh, um excuse me I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna mess this up but the i i sh i will never do this uh, sorry i i totally blanked on what you i will always i will never yes the i will always and i will never so, so at certain points in your life you've had to hold true to some of those but then you've also had to let go of some of those mm -hmm. so what is your mechanism for not maybe figuring out, but what is your process of knowing when to let go of one and when to hold on to those beliefs? Well, one of the biggest ones is because of the sexual abuse, there was, I will never trust men. Ah, yeah. that's a good start. And I married one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and really, um, you know, for years, I mean, if he rolled over and touched me, he got kicked or elbowed. Wow. You know, because I slept at attention, if you will. Now he comes to bed and I'm like, what time did you come to bed? I don't even realize where he is. Um, but I recognize, and that's why when I when I found um, Soligu, Marc Wisquet, um, I knew I wanted to get rid of that fear. My mother had put us through, psych you know, we went to psychologists and things like that. But I, I remember thinking to myself, I can tell you my story all day long, but it doesn't get rid of the pain. Mm. The pain is still there. 
Um, and, you know, and I'm tired. I, I can remember at 17, I'm like, I'm tired of telling my story. I'm never going to forget it, but how do I release myself from the emotional hurts and bruises and pains? And not many, you don't find many people that can teach you how to do that. Yeah. But you, you find it in, I would say, the more esoteric practices, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, yoga, breath work, uh, holotropic breathing. And, and through that, those processes, you know, which I was lucky enough to be exposed to, I realized I could like purge purge this stuff and actually really heal myself versus just knowing that, okay, you know, she was abused, she was poor. So therefore this is her life. Right. And um, so that's, as, as I encountered, um, there's, there's actually a great um, video. It's on YouTube. It's of Will Smith talking about fear. It's a compilation of interviews that he's done from the time he's young. And it's like, I want to say like 10 minutes long. And I really related to when I saw it the first time, he said, the thing he was afraid of the most was being afraid of being afraid. Mm. And so he, he attacked his fears. It's really a video worth watching. And I feel like I related to him because it, it felt like, all right, if I ran into a fear, I was going to go after it and I was going to remove it because I felt like it was prison to me. And I didn't want to be in prison. I, I didn't want to be afraid not to do something because I, I might lose money or somebody might not like it or I might get judged or worst, I might be crazy, you know, because I was afraid of being crazy because my mother also had schizophrenia. So me hearing voices that was why I studied it. You know, I was going to attack that fear. I'm like, okay, if I have it, I'm going to know what it is. Yeah. Well, bring it into the light. I mean, you're bringing those fears into a light where you can understand where they come from. Um, yeah. You know, and, and as you were speaking about some of your traumas, it was, um, I don't want to say matter of fact, but you, you recognize and have the memory of the experience. And I'm sure there is an emotional connection there, but you're not identified with that. You don't seem... Uh, to be attached to the person that went through that, even though that is part of your story and it has guided you through so many different aspects of your life, it was something to learn and transcend from versus something to identify with. And I think that is, you know, you said it's hard to find people that will guide you through that process because it it's a deep and dark process and it's it's hard to hold somebody's hand through something like that you know, especially if I look at it from my experience, I don't have any experiences like that. I, I can sympathize and empathize to a certain degree, but I, I will not be able to relate to a situation like that to the degree where, I, but I can give you the space to discover how not to be afraid of that situation. And that is that is the the ground floor of what you would need to have and we don't have that in a lot of, you know, even spiritual um, right. institutions. So the, that you found that process, I mean, that speaks volumes for sure. Yeah. I, I, you know, I feel like spiritually, you know, because I, I do have strong spiritual principles and guidance uh, feelings that, um, you know, I, I would look back and, and when I do, you know, um, Corinne, you asked if I do these workshops, I do. And I will tell people now that I wouldn't change my past for anything. Um, I don't wish it on anyone. Um, and and I, I look at, but I look at where it brought me to. Um, and I see so many, I can't tell you how many women I've coached executive women, you know, through the workshops I've done over the last, there was at least um, one woman in every workshop, if not two, that had the same experiences I did. Wow. The interesting thing was, and I jokingly say this, but it's, it's, a, it's not a joke, is I never met an abuser. When what I mean by that is that there was no one who ever admitted that except for one. And I did, I've done these programs for close to 30 years. I know there were abusers in there just by the law of numbers, you know, but it's such a 
deep dark place, but how common it is for for particularly women. And you know, over the years, I would say since about two thousand six or seven, men began to be more open about that kind of abuse or suffering that kind of abuse as well. Before it was never we just didn't talk about it, and um, and so I feel like I again, was lucky enough to be put in a place where I could speak corporate language and still be able to help these people who, who have the same emotional traumas as those who live in poverty, you know, or, you know, my case on the lower west side of Cleveland where I grew up. And, um, you know, I, I would say, and, I, and I've done a lot of work at homeless shelters over the years, because I always felt like, well, if I could get out and I didn't think I was anything special um, with the right tools, other people can do the same. It's a human capability. That's beautiful. I love that you do that work. That must be incredibly fulfilling. It is, you know, because I can, it's my way of giving back, you know, for all the great teachers I've had along the way. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and so <laughs> what's that? Sorry. And learning is not done. Yeah. Okay, yes. Not it's learning. infinite, isn't it? Infinite. Yeah. And so, okay. So timeline that you're 27, you and your husband decide to start this business. And obviously, because I can see all the training you've done, you're also simultaneously doing yoga trainings, studying with your teachers. So um, can you share a little bit more about that? Like the healing process too that was paralleling your business growth? um yeah because we could you know see things whereas uh my teachers would say you're a seer and i could know things um i did a lot of work around that uh, they, they spent a lot more time on the emotional psychological stuff at least in the beginning um because they would say this horrible thing to me you're not ready yet you're not <laughs> ready yet <laughs> get my like a little girl put my hands on my hips and I'm like yes but I can I can see people's auras why can't I learn it and you know they actually put my husband my husband did it at the same time they actually put me on a book diet if I was going to work with them I wasn't allowed to read for five years I mean I could read business stuff but I couldn't read things about energy work spirituality Buddhism any of that because their whole principle was learn this from within yourself and that that way your mind which they would say is a trickster your mind could never take it and make wow. you think that you understood it instead you would have the experience of knowing um, we were also required took a lot of discipline to not drink we did not have any alcohol for close to 15 years during that process. Now we were very busy raising, my husband had four children when I met him. We were very busy raising children. We were, you know, building our business. We got very lucky. Uh, luck, luck, luck is opportunity meet, met, meeting up with preparedness. So we, we've had an international business and we, we were able to go, we've been able to go around the world, see some amazing, meet amazing people, go to amazing places. And so alcohol would have just taken our energy. Mm. And, and it's, it's not that we, we do like wine. We like really good wine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when we moved to Virginia, you know, I live like a half a mile from a really good winery and they have really good wine. And how do I know that? Because I've had some. <laughs> um, and, and, and so I actually, um, we made that commitment for our own personal healing. And so over the years, that, that's how we got into all this stuff. And, and, and we just felt like that work of learning from those teachers. And because I wasn't ready, you know, I, I also have this, I'll show you side of me that I would go to other teachers, you know, if they weren't willing to teach me when I wanted to learn, I would go to other teachers and had, again, the great opportunity to meet a number of wonderful uh, teachers along the way. Um, some from the Hindu tradition, some from the Buddhist tradition. In fact, where I live, um, there's an ashram by Swami Sachidananda, you know, not even an hour from my house. And there's um, a Buddhist retreat center within a mile 
I mean, an hour of my house, you know, so there's a lot of places around here that I'm able to go and take time out and restore myself. Um, but we found that if we were going to keep at the pace that we were going, we in a way had no choice but to um, do this kind of healing work on ourselves. Wow. So you were, uh, at what at what point did you start um, working with these these guides? We, we had the conversation, you don't, uh, not a teacher or a shaman, but what these guides, when did they come into your life? Um, we started our business in 1990 and we started going to Tony and Raquel in like 1992. And it was at that point because it was such, you know, when you start a business, I mean, most businesses will fail in the first three years. And, um, you know, Barry had four children that, you know, the mortgage wasn't going to stop and they were going to need to eat. And so there was, we had a lot of stress starting from the ground up because we were ex-bankers. We weren't executive coaches. We didn't know, or we didn't even know the term organizational development. And that was the field we went into. Um, you know, so we had to do a lot to, to learn about the business we decided to start and then how to sell it and then how to make money at it and how not to be all things to all people. And so when Tony and Raquel came in, we were actually, Barry and I were actually at a critical juncture of like needing to strangle each other <laughs> um, because it was just that, that stress. So, I mean, the first couple of years was really uh, removing of stress and what stress it's a fight or flight response. That's a fear response. Yeah. You know, so we spent the first couple of years, you know, that's when get off the alcohol, get off the book reading. Um, and, you know, I still read the Harvard business review and things like that. Um, have, and then I, I had 10 years of like watching the wall street journal because I had been in finance before that. So that kind of reading, but, um, we did all of our work with them in the early days. And through that process is one of the things that I think what, what people don't realize is that as you peel away the shit that we have around us from our emotional traumas, your natural gifts, just whatever you want to call a gift, just open up. Yeah. So well, it's there. So it sounds like that that um, book fast, if you will, was, was them stopping you from piling more and more intellectualized tools on top of the things that they recognize maybe you needed to strip away first. Exactly. Um, so that, that's a lot of wisdom in that. I mean, that's, that's a ground floor wisdom, discipline, and, you know, pinpointing certain aspects of what they recognize in you that are, are not good for you, but you don't know that yet, right? You didn't at that time when you're, you know, given those tasks, didn't probably understand to the degree how long, um, you sound like a, a somewhat rebellious natured person. How long did it take you to trust their, their guidance and, and practice? Was it a, quite a while or? It was actually on my third visit. And so I know you're going over to uh, a part of Tennessee where they live. It was the third visit I went there because the first two visits, I was uh, screaming my lungs out, getting rid of fear and anger and pain and fear and fear and, um, <laughs> and more fear. Um, and I, 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 inside myself, because my husband didn't know I could see things and hear voices and we've been married for already three years. And um, so I went and I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to test them because remember I said I was Buddha eyes, I was psychologized, I was Catholicized, you don't know. I was mudra eyes because they were saying, oh, you know, no, that's a mudra. And I'm like, that's a mudra. <laughs> I mean, um, and when, when we sat down, it was my third visit with them. Tony looks at me and she said, all right, I know you have a test for me. So give me your test. And I thought, well, I mean, I've been here twice. I have a very skeptical mind too. Of course, she's going to figure that out. And so then it was as if she was inside my head. And she said, all right, that voice that you hear that you've never told Barry about. And I'm like, oh, well, that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't say it to anybody. 
you know, because I was I was quite sure under the DSM-4, I was schizotypal, but I was highly functioning. And then she began to explain to me the experiences and situations that I'd spoken to no one about. And so that was like, all right, she's got something that is unique and special and I need to, I need to stay put for a while. And then 20 some odd years, 26 years later, you know, I stay, I'm still staying put. Yeah. <laughs> so they must've been the ones that introduced you to Don and Patty or? No, I actually introduced them. Okay. They moved there. I found them after my husband and I sold our place. We, we actually thought of building a retreat center and then we thought, oh, this is too much work in the same area. And so then I was one day just doing some research, just trying to find a, a, you know, a retreat center where we could do, where I could do some workshops. And then I see this thing in well-being center in New Tazewell. I'm like, what? When did they come? And so I went and visited them. And then they asked me, they said, well, ha have you heard about the Native American guy that lives back in a holler. And I said, yeah, Rock Whiskey, back in Bear Creek holler. Yes, I know him. Oh, you do? I'm like, yeah, you want to meet him? <laughs> and, then, and so I called Rocke, he came over and I think we spent the whole day and a half just talking to Don, Patty, uh, Rocke and myself um, about everything. Yeah. It, was, it was a wonderful, it was such a wonderful day. And, and then he's been going over there um, doing some of the ceremony. He's taking care of the land, taking care of the medicines and um, doing that kind of work with them. So mm, that's beautiful. How do you end up in a place like that, right? Right. In the, in the middle of nowhere, really. I mean, near Knox, an hour outside of Knoxville. Yeah. But there, I feel like it's, I mean, obviously you do as well. There's a, and I'm sure. I mean, we don't really know this for sure, but it sounds like, you know, Don and Patty, I'm sure they were psychically drawn there because of all the groundwork that they led already. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a very, I mean, there is a very special piece of land. I mean, the retreats that happen there are powerful because they're wonderful teachers, but it's also the land. It's that also is, the land. It's so much the land. Yeah. Sean's actually going for the first time Wednesday. Yeah. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. Well, and we've we've done interviews with both Don and Patty, you know, uh, separately. So um, I've had my world rocked uh, <laughs> subsequently, you know, in, in in between all that. So I'm I'm looking forward to it, and I think it's going to be a great opportunity. And you know, it's a testament to the the space that we what we can create, or that can be created by you know, I don't know, maybe not any human being, but you know, it is there is a sacredness that we can, you know, bring on the land. But I, I think it takes the kind of wisdom you're talking about where th there's a respect, a presence of mind, you know, there's, and there's so many other things going into that, the intuition, uh, connecting literally with the space as if it was a living, you know, breathing entity. And, and when, when you enter those spaces, you know, it's the most humbling thing you can, kind of think of in a lot of ways because like you know to your story it's like here's this thing that nobody should ever know about and it, it's it's being discussed i'm it's seemingly casual you know by this person so i mean i can only imagine the layers of work that happened after that where here's this thing that this great fear that you have of people finding this out telling you know your husband and then it's it's almost dismissed casually as just part of who you are, I can only imagine the affirmation of, I don't know, relief and acceptance that comes with some of that, you know, that experience. Yeah. You know, I, I so like you in particular, we call her Tony. Um, I say that she was like my friend, my mother, my coach, my enemy my teacher, my guide, my mother, you know, my sister. She, she played a lot of roles because, you know, I really didn't have a mother growing up. You know, when I was younger, yes, but then when all of that other stuff happened, I lost a, a strong female role. And, and Tony certainly played that for, for me. 
And so then we had that kind of relationship, not only just like a mother daughter, but teacher or student and um, friends. And we'd go out and have girls weekends. And, and I was, I felt very um, um, humbled to have been with her when she uh, exhaled her last breath. And, um, you know, feeling like that it was finally time for, for me to, to grow up and then become, you know, the elder, if you will, to carry what she had shared with me and what Rock Wieske, it's not to say Rock Wieske wasn't important, but I really needed that female um, guidance for such a long time. And, you know, and so Rock Hay, has been somewhat of a, a of a father figure, but not really in that way. Just more of a powerful um, male figure that you know just doesn't have a lot of the the shit that some so many of us grow up with. And at the same time, he's very strong, so he he can be like, whoa, <laughs> you need him, you know, because he 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 sees things and he just rakwiske means in the place of the turtle. So Ligiu means uh, the woman who walks in the spirit world. And so you can say something and Raquel will say that, take the word the and delayer that for about five hours. <laughs> oh, Sean, you would love that. <laughs> so much. <laughs> it, you know, and because he goes deep, deep, deep within you and, and what, what you put together in terms of your story and, and how that keeps you trapped rather than being who you are and who you are is, is spirit. I can share with you a fun story about Rock Hay, oh, since please. you guys are gonna be meeting him. So he, he was um, doing this meditation with me, he was sitting on the couch. It lasted 150,000 years. And um, <laughs> <laughs> was like, that was I wanted thing. to die. Like just <laughs> shoot me, right? That kind of thing. So he was asking me, I was, he got me deep into meditation and then I, and he has a very booming voice and he's asked me this question. He says, who are you? And I get an answer and I hear no. And then he asked me a question again and I answer and no, no, no. And this went on for like 150,000 years of this, not getting the right answer, right? About who are you really, 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 really. And so then I was like, I, um, and you'll understand this, my how, in a moment, went, ah, I know the answer. I said, I'm spirit. And then I don't hear a no coming back. I'm like, got him. And then he, I hear, explain more. And I start to explain it. And then I hear, no. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. You know, and then um, he goes, he keeps going on. And then finally, I just start laughing because the end of Space Odyssey, 2001, comes into my brain and I hear, Dave, <laughs> Dave. And I went, oh my God, I'm Hal. And I say this out loud and then Raquel goes, no. And I'm like, oh no, Raquel, I'm Hal. I am a complete programmed automaton computer or at least that's who I've been. And it was in that moment I made the separation. Now now I'm laughing and he's still saying no to me and trying to explain to him who Hal is. Right. <laughs> you know? because he doesn't watch TV. He doesn't see movies, you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, so ever since then, you know, I've always affectionately called that part of me, that programmed part of me, Hal. And when Hal wants to take over and not, live out of my true nature, out of fear, got to get her done, you know, got 15 projects I got to get done for clients, which can immediately take you out of your inner space of your own being and directly into your mind. But, you know, that was talk about another turning point. I, yeah, I will never forget that very painful meditation that, and in particular, Jen, just laughing and laughing and laughing, trying to explain how. Rock yeah. And, and, the movie. <laughs> yeah. And, and so powerful too, because, you know, I've been a, <clears throat> a spiritual life coach for many years myself, and it doesn't do any good to tell people this stuff at all. They have to 
just as we have had to. We have to have these ahas. And so he, w the way he was guiding you was so beautiful for you to go in and only you could have come up with how. Right. Yeah. You know, the, the, the and so the spirit within you is so, so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that separation and that, the realization, you know, uh, as you're as you're trying to articulate you know who you are so many times over and over and over again and and then that clear recognition of that separation of the i am and then the hal <laughs> to use your terms you know the, those two things coexisting it it's a trip for for a while to have that so i and that that must be that must be such an experience to recall that memory, n knowing that you you were actually onto something, but he didn't actually understand the context from what you were speaking. So, like, you know, th th but I think that's also a testament to how we come to that recognition so uniquely, e each of us so uniquely, because you have to sift through all your own bullshit yeah. to discover your own hell, really. And, <laughs> and, and nobody else is going to, nobody else can tether that. You know, I think, I think we have certain substances and we have experiences that can give us a glimpse of that, that, you know, I don't want to call it separate nature, but that, that separation of realizing the difference there. Mm -hmm. And, but to, to, to do the work and discover that on your own is monumental. And, and it, it does bring laughter. My, Corinne and I had a very, very sim similar situation. Uh, it was actually with psychedelics, but um, all that did would, was make me look at everything. And, and I swear to God, it was about four or five hours of just laughing at all of the things, the ridiculous natures, the, the, the identities, the, the parts of ourselves. And, and it was, I was spiraled back into it. I was spiraled back into the identities and Corinne was just sitting there looking at me and she would just start laughing. She's like, I can't, I can't take you seriously because you're just spinning out, you know? And it was calling me back to, oh, and I'd be like, oh shit, I am. And then, you know, I'd do it again. And I, it was just like this play that I would go on for, for days. So I, I, I resonate with that experience to a certain degree in discovering that, that part of yourself, that, that unreal part of yourself. You know that you've the programmed part of yourself that you've lived by for so long. So, man, I'm I'm proud and excited for you that you've had that experience. <laughs> yeah, I look back with fondness on that hundred and fifty thousand year <laughs> meditation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the point I want to make too with that that stands out for me is just the fact that when you said you were how you were so sure that it didn't matter that this teacher you, you respected so greatly said no. <laughs> that's how innate you, you had no problem explaining it to him. And that's the difference between being defensive of something you don't really believe and actually embodying something that you know to be truth within your being. And no matter what anybody else says, it's like, no, this is it. So I love that. Actually, it was just perfect how that aha came to you in such a unique way at, at that he didn't understand immediately that yeah. from, yeah. 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 Awesome. She, I mean, we, 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 I mean, obviously there's so much, is there anything, I mean, I, I could talk to you for a very long time. Um, is there anything else that you want to share? Uh, um, cause we've already gone over an hour, even though we, we love talking to people that we love talking to. Um, but anything else you want to mention about what you're doing currently or anything you're working on? Well, you know, I recently started, um, my second corporate business because an idea came to me on how to teach people much more at scale than my other company and you know it's called being real and that came to me about five years ago and this whole idea I, I would tell people just landed on my head because Matsu's brain would not have done this to herself but um, I ended up developing software as a service which I have no background in or experience in that's designed to teach people the steps. And I think of it as like a bridge 
is that if I can get people to actually recognize there's a bridge to something better, then they can have the choice for going over the bridge, you know, to find their true, true nature. But if they don't know it exists, then they've got to be stepped there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people spend a good majority of their life in the corporate world. And so that's why I think of myself as doing my dance is in the corporate world. And um, so I, the name of my company is called Lindsay's Conscious Business. And Lindsay's actually means in Latin to have keen insight. And so I realized, and this was really only three weeks ago, um, met some other Native American elders recently. And I introduced myself in an indigenous way, which I had never done before. But I shared with them that um, what I help organizations do and leaders do is help them gain the insight that they need to become conscious so that therefore they can become real. And even though I've been in this business five years, that was the first time that I feel like I even understood the mission of what I was, what I am doing. And so, you know, I'm able to now, rather than working with, you know, an executive coaching, maybe five or 10 leaders a year, I'm able to get to thousands a year to help them become real. And for me, that's helping people take the first steps of realizing their true nature. And, um, and because I made my number at 42, I don't, I'm very lucky. I don't have to work. The financial rewards come out of, you know, there's, um, you know, uh, Khalil Gibran's work is love made visible. And then I think it was, was it at Napoleon Hill, do what you love, the money will follow? Or was that Dale Carnegie? I don't remember. But anyway, um, you know, I've been finding that by teaching this, more than becoming real is that they're becoming free. And then when you're free on the inside, you can make true choice. And so I'm just having a blast doing it, you know, and it pays for my yoga habit. Yeah. You know, or me, me taking retreats and um, learning from other teachers and, you know, just enjoying this great adventure called life. What, what a, what a great tool for, you know, in general, but specifically for the time that we're in, you know, we had a reset, we have a shift in, you know, consciousness to, to a certain degree, people realizing, you know, how volatile things are and how, you know, it's, it's this quick little wake up, but then to be able to offer something that, that is a tool for people to continue to grow, to continue to be in that awakened state in that real state, as you, you know, you kind of mentioned that, I, I mean, that's the more tools we have to shift consciousness towards mindfulness behavior, you know, connected mindfulness behaviors on, on every level to whatever degree we're working on, you know, that's, that's huge. That's a huge expanse. So, you know, that's, that's cool. Yeah. It's beautiful, beautiful life. Um, Dharma. Thank you. Beautiful life, Dharma. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for your time, for sharing with us your your intimate, beautiful uh, story. And um, I hope we get to meet in person, maybe at Wellbeing, or if you ever come to Nashville, you've got a room here at my place. We've got, my house is like a kind of a spiritual gathering place we call the Ivy House. Um, so I don't know if you met Colleen when you were at Wellbeing. Yeah, that's my, my room, my, usually my room, maybe she's been living at Wellbeing for the past <laughs> year. Yeah, I've met her twice, and I'm yeah. actually going to be in Nashville in September. Please, if you like, want, want to come and eat, have tea or come and stay, welcome to both. So um, reach out for sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And we are in the Say More section with Susan Robertson. I... Did not expect that conversation to go the way it went. Um, I usually don't have expectations because I don't do a whole lot of vetting of anybody at any point. But I was really surprised at her um, empowered nature, given her you know background and her stories. 
Yeah, it was a, a treat for me. Um, you know, it was somebody that I didn't know that Patty from Wellbeing Center referred to me and Colleen and Matt. And of course, I looked up her websites and did did my due diligence and had a few email communications with her. And she looked like she had a, a wonderful uh, she's a wonderful teacher and, and an interesting life, but you just never know how yeah. these conversations are going to go. And uh, yeah, she's just um, she's just a light in the world and, and very clear. Yeah. You know, just very clear about her her path and her journey and very willing to uh, share share her intimate details of her life. Man, and I, I think it's I find it from where I sit in life and, you know, my experiences, I, I have had a really fortunate, you know, upbringing. I've, I've not had, you know, I, I've had personal traumas, you know, mental traumas of my own, things that I've had to deal with, of course, you know, the biggest hurdles in my own life, but relating it to, you know, the, the physical world of sexual abuse, of, you know, physical or uh, mental abuse, emotional abuse. Poverty. Poverty, I don't, I don't relate to that from an experience standpoint. I of course can sympathize, empathize with it, and I have extreme compassion for people that go through those circumstances. But I oftentimes, in talking about spirituality and you know, the seeking process, I, I often feel like I might not have context for everybody to be able to relate to their situation. And, and sometimes I feel like maybe I'm up on this, you know, barely struggled pedestal trying to talk to people about, well, you don't have to identify with your problems. You don't have to wear that. You don't have to have this attachment to it. And, and those things can be true, but it's hard to bridge that gap. And I think hearing her story, what she went through, but then watching her be on the empowered side of that where you can tell she must have done immense amount of work to, to like she said, she attacked fear. And I, I knowing what that process has been like from, from my angle of going through the fears in my own life, imagining how that must have been compounded going through such a, you know, long period of time with that much trauma, it, we need, we need this conversation. We need people having that and hearing that perspective because that's that's somebody who is a testament you know it's one thing to have the ideology have the conversation from from where i look at my point of view knowing what i've grown how or how i've grown spiritually but to be a testament of no i did go through that but i also know that mindfulness discipline and detaching myself from that as a story that's going to be all consuming is possible fucking power to her i mean seriously power to her yeah yeah i, I you know what i loved i loved i was hoping we would i'd get to bring this up in the same more section but i know you loved it your ears a little part perked up when <laughs> she said um that her teachers told her not to read a book for five years <laughs> i was like I have been trying to tell every. I've been telling you I don't read books. I don't need to read books, <laughs> which is which is hilarious. Parallel to that is because because I've intellectualized that I don't need the books. <laughs> she <laughs> was intellectualizing that she needed the books, and somebody from a wise standpoint told her not to. And yeah, so I did. I related to to that very much so because that has has been my process. Um, what's funny about that though is that it's a rather clumsy process because uh, – and, and I think I rejected reading, you know, a little background on Sean, uh, something that I've learned. Actually, I've learned this from watching um, some conversations about gospel, you know, the, the teachings of Christ, you know, Christianity. And the, the vantage point I have now about the wisdom – that is in the Gospels is, th yeah, there's wisdom in the Gospels. I've actually been using the Gospels in a lot of contexts with talking to people uh, about mindfulness, you know, that, that have a background in Christianity. And 
it's really funny to be pointing to that because for a long time, as you know, you know, my early 20s into my, you know, through my 20s, I rejected Christianity and the, and the Bible to almost the, the furthest degree you can. I, From my experience, it was shallow and um, I was... I thought there was so much more wisdom in so many other facets of life and, you know, different teachings. So I kind of became a a rebel to all spiritual, you know, doctrines <laughs> because, because I felt like if there's falseness in this one doctrine, th- then all of them must be, you know, false to a certain degree. And why would I read that when I can find the wisdom inside, blah, 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 blah. Obviously, that's been clumsy, as you've known <laughs> from my experience. But now, returning to the perspective and listening to people's perspectives about about their experiences and what they've learned from these different uh, texts, I've just not been reading them from that open, you know, perspective. I have been closed off going into the process of reading something. Well, of course you're. Of course, if you go into that, that's the space you're in, you're not going to find anything because you're closed off the minute you start reading. So I, it has been a fun uh, unraveling of that whole process. So thank you for calling that out because it's it's been a real you know thing on my mind lately about you know how and why I've gone through that way. Yeah, and I you know and I and I want to honor the intuition with that too because I certainly you know, was a voracious reader in my 20s and in my, even my 30s, I I had five or six books going all the time. I had five or six, I actually have right now five or six books. I just don't pick them up much anymore because then there became a period in my 40s where I didn't read anything. Yeah. Like nothing. And I, so I see the value of both. Like I see the value of her teachers telling her not to read because we do get stuck in dogma and dogma tends, but dogma can come down, not just in books, can come come get through a podcast you know dogma can come in many many different ways but honoring your intuition to how you want to receive wisdom knowledge yes I mean the first thing Deepak Chopra said the first seminar I went you know 30 years ago Deepak's like I'm not here to teach you anything new I'm here to help you remember what you already know which is hilarious because I think he gets attacked from a lot of you know uh people in the spiritual community for trying to rewrite the whole thing. I mean, I think there, I've heard people describe that process and knowing the background is like, like you just said, he is saying, I'm not teaching you anything new. You know, I'm, there's nothing new under the sun, right. there's different ways of looking at the wisdom, right. but we have that wisdom within us, you know? And yet, so, so it's like both are true. Like I can see where the books have helped me in my life. I can see where I've gotten stuck in some things that I've read. I can see where books have helped to open me. Now we have YouTube, we had podcasts, you know, when I was in my twenties and thirties, we didn't have YouTube or podcasts. So books were the only ways that we could find out other people's stories and hear, you know, and that hearing other people's stories, you know, I've always been fascinated with autobiographies always Mm. since I was like a teenager. I love hearing how people figure out life. Yeah. I feel like it, it helped me. And so, um, and so, but now we get to hear it on YouTube and podcasts and TV and, you know, Super Soul Sunday and all these different. So, you know, you, it, it's on, it's like a discernment of what, you know, whatever you're drawn to. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that, and what's, what's funny is, you know, in, in her experience of that, it, it wasn't that he was saying reading is bad. It wasn't, it wasn't the reading at all. It was what the reading what her relationship was to the reading because the the teacher could see that all the reading is doing is adding more programming yeah, or, or at least adding more things in the way of the deep programming to use our language. I'm sure he would have used different language and I'm sure they had different conversations, but that's what it felt like to me was recognizing that that mechanism of you're just trying to you're thinking that adding more on top of this is going to give you the clarity to see the things that you need to let go of. And and I think that was the relationship that was playing out in that experience. So, so I mean, that's, that's a funny thing because 
you can turn that whole mechanism into a dogma then and say, mm-hmm. oh, he must say that same thing for everybody. I'm going to stop reading. No, not necessarily at all. Nothing correlates necessarily depending on your relationship with the thing. And that's that's kind of what we're uncovering with with mindfulness and this you know, non-duality is – the character that we are, the, this reality, being in this reality, playing this role, using these identities, that's not the issue. The issue is the relationship that you have with those identities. The issue is, are you attaching to them and believing that this identity is who you are? Or are you just playing that role for a moment? Right. You're, you're not having a foot in, in the absolute. That's right. what gets people into trouble is, is, as you said, when they identify with the thoughts, feelings, and emotions, rather than helping unstick the Velcro a little bit. And, you know, I recently had this conversation with one of my coaching clients. She's like, she's very stuck at the moment of her life situation. She wants life to be different than it is. Mm. Like, as soon as I get this, I'm going to be happy. Yes. And that's a surefire failure recipe. If anything, if you think you're going to be happy with the smallest thing to the biggest thing, when something happens, you, you might be happy for a moment, but the, the happiness that you're looking for is in this moment, not in the next. It's not with anything that comes and goes. And it's very, and I understand that because I've been there. Yeah. And she'll get it when she gets it. But boy, I'm telling you, she's helped me for many years because I've been working with her for many years. She's helped me to for me to come up with like a hundred different ways to say the same thing. I mean, it helped me in my book because yeah. that's <laughs> the part of the pitch for my book is like, I, you know, I feel like younger uh, women are drawn to me like in their 20s and 30s for whatever reason. I think it's because I'm candid about my past and that I have, you know, a sort of people can relate to my sordid past and, and, um, and, and it's like, I, there, I had layers uncovered for me many over the years. I can look back now seeing where I was stuck. And so to, to document those and, and, and to go back into those stories and see how I had different ahas I mean, I'm hoping that as these young ladies are reading the different twists and turns, that they might be able to see a parallel in their lives and see, um, you know, beyond the illusion, uh, you know, that kept, because the ego is very tricky. The identity is very tricky in it. And like I said, you get it when you get it. It it is. And it's convoluted and it's designed to trick you personally better than any person, you know, possible. And it will play to your best interest and it will play to your darkest fear that this 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 ego mechanism that wants to predict and control and manage the program that you operate from it is it is hell-bent on self-preservation even though it's not actually anything really real and and that's that's what's hard you know and and i've struggled with that relationship in in my own you know world and to hear to hear from like susan's perspective of that many more things stacked on top you know and you're gonna get it when you get it and she had so many blessings that maintained a relationship with mindfulness while going through that process you know oftentimes people like your your client that you're kind of describing probably never had or recognized a, a person in their life that gave them mindfulness tools or a discipline in mindfulness tools until she found, you know, you. And then you're starting that process of mindfulness. And it's it's a tricky process. And the more things you have layered on, the longer it can potentially take to, you know, unstick that stuff. And it And yet as Rupert Spira says, it it, it doesn't have to take years either. Correct. Yes. You know, it's like the truth of the joy, the inherent unlimited joy that's within you at all times 
is always there, not just when you decide to realize it. It just gets convoluted and covered up and mixed in with thoughts, feelings, emotions, experiences. And so there has to be, it's almost like there has, I don't say there has to be because we've interviewed some people where there hasn't been pain, but it's like that pain is like, gives you the passion and the, the focus to be able to cut through the illusion, the Maya. Yes. Yes. And, and great. And thank you for that distinction because here I am, you know, putting a projection on how long it should take to unstick all that stuff. Point in case like that, that is just a, program, you know, I'm blowing something out of proportion and creating more space and distance in between the potential when really that potential is right here right now all the time. So thank you for, you know, that distinction of that. Yeah, I mean, it's a comma. I certainly had it for many years and didn't understand otherwise. I mean, you have much more of an understanding of this specific concept at your age than I did, certainly. Um, because I was told that in my thirties, when I was on this crazy spiritual journey, that it doesn't have to be a journey, you know, that, that it's, it, you know, awakening is here now. And sometimes, you know, the practices can get in the way. And I, I didn't get that because the practices helped me feel better and right. did seem to be my journey. And, and it's like, on one hand, I did need it on the other th- hand, it was always there. So it's what Rupert Spira calls the direct path. So the path, so, so the path that I've been on my whole life seems to have been the progressive path with points of direct path, but now I'm definitely on the direct path now. Um, so, so it's like I've had this progression, this peeling away and understanding and deepening and the wisdom. It's like I had all this experience, spiritual experiences when I was quite young, but I didn't have any language or words to put, I didn't understand it. So it was like on one hand, it was good that I didn't understand it, but on the other hand, it was like, I don't know. It's not good or bad. It's just the way it was for me. And so there has had this apparent growth in understanding. And yet the truth of our existence and the beingness is always here. And like, it doesn't, it doesn't grow. There's an apparent growth. Right. (laughs) And I don't know if this is making sense at all. I'm laughing because it does. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) No, no. No, keep going. Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. There no, is a, no. There is an apparent growth because th- there is an apparent getting closer to it. All that really is is the re- is the realization of how close it actually always yes. is. Yes. The, the realization, you know, laps is shorter and shorter, but the the present moment is as close as possible, as close as anything, closer than everything. You know. Yeah. So it it is if you're using a if you're using a practice from an intellectualized state of of experience it is counterintuitive. Yes, the mind can't comprehend it. Right. But like when like when Susan had that meditation that what you say 150,000 year, you know, meditation that realization, that moment of everything clicking and making sense, that that joy of realizing all the things that she was, you know, the, the hell that she was, but then discovering the vastness beyond that, you know, th- that is, it's a fucking hilarious moment. I don't know how else to put it. It's a comedy. It's a fucking comedy when you realize it. I mean, I because it's this belligerent, belligerent joy. Like, it's like when you've it's it's like when you're looking for your car keys and they're in your fucking hand. You know that moment where you're like, "Where's my car keys?" Where you're running 35, 40 minutes and you're just running around the house and you're just like, "Oh my god, the car keys are in my hand," and you just feel like. You just laugh out loud because you can't believe you wasted so much time looking in the every every wrong direction. And that's what it feels like to have that, you know, that expanse experience. But and then the integration, you know, and then the integration into you know remembering that really, just remembering that at all times. Remembering that at all times, consciously being aware. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 
That's some good stuff. It was a good interview. I really enjoyed it. Man, and I, I love the angle uh, that, you know, we got to dive in uh, to a little bit. I'd love to dive into more, um, you know, Native American Aboriginal uh, wisdom. Uh, that's something we haven't really, you know. I was with. actually thinking of that in the interview, thinking I've got to reach out because I've been reaching out to a lot of my Chopra people, which is a certain sort of, you yeah. know, sect of people. And I and, and yeah, I would love to reach out to. Um, in fact, I met a wonderful woman in Sedona years ago who's got a Native American background, um, and I know she she'll be she up, so we'll book her soon. And um, yeah, yeah, I, I feel I feel the branches starting to to yeah. break out of 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 people that we'll have on. So it's it's exciting, you know, the, the feelers. I've started to put the feelers out there. So please remember to subscribe, to like, and even to comment because it helps other people to find us. Yep. And um, it, that's actually really important um, aspect, even though, you know, I know you hear this every time you watch something on YouTube or hear something. But um, in order for us to grow and to continue what we do, we, we got to get some feedback because that's how the algorithms go. Yep. Healthy or otherwise, but, you know, healthy, healthy feedback is, you know, more fun to read. So <laughs> whatever all... feedback anybody wants, it's all good. <laughs> how can I'm... anybody have anything else? I'm a fragile yeah. soul. I'm a fragile soul. <laughs> Thank you Everybody so much. loves you, Sean. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be some. I love you. I love you too. So thank you for all the background work. And again, uh, I haven't thanked you for that for a while, but I am always appreciative. So let's keep them going. See you next week. Good night.